Hi, I'm Selena Lovett from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Theodora Goss, who is uh, an author of many different things. Uh, she writes uh, she, she writes poems, she writes essays, but she write, also writes novels and short stories, and mostly in the fantasy vein. Um, so uh, for readers unfamiliar with your work, how would you describe what you write? That's a really good question. Uh, and hi, Selena. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to, <laughs> it's so nice to virtually see everyone. Um, what do I write? That's a really good question. Um, I've written novels. I've written short stories. I've written poetry. I've written essays. I've even written academic papers because that's where I come from. I'm, I'm a teacher at a university. Um, but you said a fantasy vein, and I think that's a really good way of thinking about it. If we think about fantasy very broadly, which I tend to, I tend to think of fantasy as not a genre, like not a section in a bookstore, but a way of thinking about literature so that you have literature that has these kind of two poles and you can go more realistic or you can go more fantastical. And more fantastical is you know, it can be anything. It can be science fiction. It can be things with elves. Um, it could be magical realism, anything that kind of veers away from our common, ordinary, consensual idea of reality. Um, and I think that my imagination, the way my brain works, just naturally goes toward that pole, whether it's more science fictional or more metafictional or magical realistic or pure what we might call genre fantasy. So I sort of veer in that direction, but I do a lot of stuff. Why don't we start talking about your books? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so what can readers expect from your newest book? Okay. So my newest book, which I can show off because I've got it, is this. It's called The Collected Enchantments. And actually, this is a collection of my more fantasy, more genre fantasy stuff, um, both short stories and poetry. And it goes all the way back to my first published story, which was called The Rose in Twelve Petals. And it's a kind of metafictional take on uh, the Sleeping Beauty story. So it goes all the way back to that, all the way to last year, two recent stories. Um, I wouldn't even say recent, that they were the newest things, um, and I wrote them specifically for this volume. And so it's got, a, it's it's big, you can see. Um, I, I have a bunch of short stories in here. Um, they tend to be things that are more fairy tale like more fantastical, closer to myth, um, very, very much on the magical side of the spectrum. And then a whole bunch of poems about things like dragons and Snow White and Stuff, stuff like that. Wow, that sounds and interesting. The latest. <laughs> and I love this. We we had a really fun time finding this wonderful illustration by uh, a, an artist called, I think it's Katrin Wellstein. Um, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly because she's German. Aha, great. Okay. And you have another book, um, a recent book that, that uh, you were talking yeah. about earlier? Well, I can show this one off too. It's called Snow White Learns Witchcraft. And this is specifically fairy tale retellings, both poetry and short stories. Um, and the uh, artist for the cover artist for this one is the wonderful Ruth Sanderson, um, who created this original uh, piece of art for um, for for us. And um, I, I I'll tell you a little secret, which is that she actually asked me to pose for the woman in the apple. So I'm Snow White on the cover because this is pretty clearly Snow White. She she learns to do witchcraft. Um, so this is fairy tale retellings, but the books that I'm most known for, I guess, are my novels. And the first one of those was The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter. And these came out a while ago from Saga Press. There are three of them. I'm just showing you the first one because I don't want to keep flashing books at you. Okay. So um, what do you think draws readers to these kinds of books? It's a really good question. Um, I think I have a couple of different theories. One is that there are some of us in the world, 
who are just more drawn toward things that are kind of magical, things that show us worlds that don't exist. And maybe it's just something in our heads. I don't know. We have a kind of longing for magic and elves and dragons and spaceships and um, all these these stories that come out of that romantic tradition. So maybe it's something in us. Actually, I'm going to go back to an essay by J.R. Tolkien called On Fairy Stories, um, because he was speculating about this and he's smarter about this than I am. So I'm just going to take what he says. He says that there are certain people that are just drawn to these, these stories that are like fairy tales, things like that. Um, and But then he also says that there's something that this kind of literature gives us, and he talks about escape, recovery, and consolation. Um, and escape is that we get to go to some kind of magical world, we get to experience something completely different from our everyday reality. Recovery is that um, it allows us to see things anew, like our, our senses get dulled living in our ordinary world. And then we go to Middle Earth and all of a sudden we're discovering these beautiful landscapes and we see heroism and friendship. And then we come back to the world and we're like, you know, I've sort of recovered. It's like going on vacation. You come back and you're, you're sort of more rested somehow mentally. And the other is consolation. And by this, um, he means that fantasy, fantastical stories offer the possibility of a happy ending, which often doesn't exist in our world. I mean, hopefully it exists sometimes, but when you read a fairy tale, when you read a fantasy story, often what it's giving you is either a happy ending or an ending that if not completely happy is at least satisfying in some way because it's, it's a, a satisfying culmination to a story. And it gives us this kind of promise that even in our real lives, things can end happily or they can end in a way that is meaningful. Story, story does that, not all story. A lot of modern realistic fiction doesn't necessarily do that because it tries to be more like our ordinary lives. But he says that we get these three things from going away from our ordinary lives. Um, and I think readers who are looking for those things or who are satisfied by those things, or who need those things, go in that direction. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, what was the inspiration for your um, your Athena Club books? <laughs> well, so what happened with the Athena Club books is um, I was doing a PhD. I have a PhD in English literature. And um, I did my PhD on late 19th century Gothic fiction and anthropology. So I was reading a lot of books, uh, a, a lot of novels um, that had monsters in it, in them. Um, and uh, I was reading novels like Frankenstein, Strange, uh, sorry, <laughs> the Strange Case of, wait, Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? That's what it's called. <laughs> And I'm saying my own book's name, which is kind of funny. Uh, but Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, I was reading Dracula. Um, I was reading The Island of Dr. Moreau. I was actually even teaching some of these books. And I wrote a doctoral dissertation on them. And my dissertation really focused on the monsters. And the question I was asking was, why do we have monster fiction flourishing at a particular point in time? It's not a very long period of time but our classic monsters come from this particular era and it's the fin de siècle, it's the turn of the century, the change, the shift from the 19th century to the 20th century. So I was trying to answer that question and my answer ultimately that it had was that it had to do with the rise of anthropology around that time. Hmm. But while I was working on the doctoral dissertation, what I noticed is that there were a lot of mad scientists, which makes sense because this was a time when there was a lot of science. People were going, hey, science can explain the world. Um, but what if it goes crazy? What if science starts doing strange things? Uh, so they had mad scientists in literature. And what I noticed was that these mad scientists kept creating female monsters. So for example, there was the Puma woman that Dr. Moreau was working on. Um, there was, of course, even as early as 1818, 1832, which is when the 
two different editions of Frankenstein were published, mm -hmm. um, Mary Shelley, Mary Shelley was ahead of everybody else. She was already talking about mad scientists and the creation of monsters. And um, in there, Frankenstein what is asked to create a female monster by his own monster, and he ends up not doing it because he thinks she would be so dangerous. Then there is um, Arthur Mockin's The Great God Pan, where we have a female monster. We have um, Beatrice Rappuccini in Hawthorne's short story. Again, that's a little bit earlier, but there are a lot of female monsters out there and they keep getting killed. And that made me mad. I thought, wait a minute, either they're not created or they're created and they're destroyed in some way because female monsters are so scary. And I thought, you know what? I want them to live, first of all. So I want the female monsters to live. And not just that, I want them to get together. And so in my novel, and this is strange case of the alchemist daughter, um, what happens is they get together and they form a club in late 19th century London. Um, and I created two new characters of my own, um, which are the daughters of respectively Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And uh, they end up being two of the main characters. And the first character that you meet in the novel is actually um, Mary Jekyll. So she's kind of our, the first protagonist that you meet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you must have done a lot of research. I did a lot of, <laughs> yeah, it was funny, actually, because I thought I had done a lot of research. I mean, I wrote a whole doctoral dissertation on late 19th. Yeah, exactly. I thought, oh, this is a lot of research. And then I started writing the novel. And I realized that I did the wrong kind of research, because I done really? a lot of research into the literary significance of certain kinds of things and what was going on and um, scientific thinking at the time, but I hadn't done research into if you're getting into a late 19th century omnibus, how do you actually step on that first step? Because it's quite high and you're a woman and you have a skirt and how do you do that? And how high is that step? What does a late 19th century omnibus look like? So I ended up having to go to London. I went a couple of times um, and I went to, I, I did things that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Um, one of my favorite research trips was I was trying to find a particular alley and I was trying to find a way that one of my characters climbs up um, a wall. And I thought, how do I get my character up that wall? So I went to, oh, it was, um, sorry, I'm trying to remember exactly where it was. Um, uh, I, it will come to me in a minute, but it was... Um, the uh, right next to uh, where all the legal buildings are in London, uh, there's a, a field um, and there's a row of buildings and the action happens in one of those buildings, but it, it's actually a lot of stuff happens behind. So I found the alley where it could happen. So I located the alley and then I looked at the buildings there and I realized that um, because when the buildings had been built, the buildings had been built a hundred years before the action takes place in my novel. Um, so they had not had indoor plumbing originally. And in the Victorian era, in the late Victorian era, they put in plumbing, but they put the pipes on the outside. So there's a pipe for my character to climb up. So that's uh -huh. the kind of research I did. I was going around London, going down these little alleys and looking at pipes. Um, I went to the transport museum and looked at carriages and omnibuses and, and tried to figure out, um, you know, how my characters would get around. Actually, I was at a writer's festival at one point and um, I, I was being interviewed by um, a, another writer for a panel. And she said, I want to play a game with you and I'm going to give you a word and it's going to be either a monster or a form of Victorian transportation. Um, and she would say, okay, barouche, monster or form of transportation. And I got every single one of them correct. So I, I can name, I, at least I could at that time, I could name all the carriages. So it was, it was a lot of fun. It was really good. It was a lot of fun to do research, but it's very different from what you would expect. It's not the way you would usually do research. Writing research is kind of its own animal. 
Mm -hmm. So was that your absolute favorite research story or do you have another one? Well, my favorite, I'm not, you, no, actually, this is a good story. Sorry, I was trying to remember. My favorite research story is for the third novel in this series, I had to go to uh, St. Michael's Mount. St. Michael's Mount is in um, Cornwall. So I was going from London. It was quite a long trip by train. The train was, for some reason, it was absolutely full of football fans. And we're talking British football. So what Americans would call soccer, they were mostly drunk. I think they were celebrating something. It must, there must have been some game and their team had won. Or something. <laughs> long, long trip. So I go down to Cornwall and I was staying in Penzance and I have quite a lot of that third novel happening in that area. So I was walking around quite a lot, um, but St. Michael's Mount is a an old it was an old monastery um and if anyone has seen pictures of Mont Saint Michel in France it was based on that so it's an island it's a small island the monastery was built on it it's now a museum it was it's still partly a private house um I believe uh but it was a private house for a long time after the dissolution of the monasteries um but it's imagine a monastery medieval monastery uh, with additions, more recent additions, but built on this island. And when the tide comes in, it's all, it's just ocean there. Uh, and when the tide goes down, there's a causeway and you can walk on the causeway. So you can go out to the island, but you have to sort of time it. And that became part of the plot, of course. Um, but I, I went and there's a little tour and I went on the little tour and then I went on the little tour again. And then I went on the little tour again, because I was trying to sort of plot out where things were happening in my novel. And the guards started going, is she casing the joint? <laughs> what is this woman doing here? Is she going to try to steal something? What's going on? <laughs> and uh, at one point, I remember going up to one of them and saying, uh, and it was in the little chapel there. I, I knew that I wanted them to get to the top, the highest point. And I was like, what's the highest point? How would you get there? And there was a little set of stairs I could see. And I said, you know, wh where does that go? And he said, oh, that goes to the roof. Um, and I said, do you know what it looks like? And he said, well, you can't go up there. And I said, no, no. But has anyone gone up there? Do you have any idea what it looks like up there? I'm writing a book and it's going to be set here. And he said, okay, I've actually been up there and he told me what it would look like and what was up on the roof, which was really funny. And some of it, um, it was really helpful too, because he said there's a big metal basin up there and it used to be for defense. Um, but I had, I think I had my characters light a fire in it or something like that. Um, but yeah, that was, that was my, uh, I guess that's one of my favorite research stories when they thought, somebody thought I might be trying to steal something from St. Michael's Mount. <laughs> But then I also, for the second book, I did research in Vienna um, because half of that book approximately happens in Vienna. And um, I was literally, quite literally going around, tasting all, ordering all the different kinds of cakes because my characters eat cakes, they go to cafes. I was doing this in Vienna and Budapest. So that's not quite as exciting a research story, but it was quite nice research. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> So this, okay. I loved writing these books. They gave me um, reasons to go to these absolutely wonderful places. I'd never been to Vienna before, and it was fascinating. Ah, so what was the biggest challenge that you had in writing and putting out um, that series? Oh, my gosh. Uh, the biggest challenge for me always is time because I'm a full-time teacher, I teach a full-time schedule at my university. And at the time I was teaching also part-time on top of that at, at, uh, in a Master of Fine Arts program. Um, and I, even since then I've done all sorts of different things. I was doing a Fulbright teaching in Budapest last spring. So I'm almost always teaching. Um, and so finding the time to write for me is always the biggest challenge. If I have the time, I can sit down, I can do it, I can write, 
but just finding the time. And of course, the energy after grading papers, that's always the hardest thing. Wow. So um, in your, um, in the Athena Club series, what, was there one character that you absolutely loved or hated in that series? Which was your favorite character or which was your least favorite character? That's a really good question. Um, I don't have any least favorite characters. I really like all of the characters that I create. Mm -hmm. That's um, good. And I, I try, I mean, I try not to create characters that I would, well, that's not quite true. I, I have actually created characters that I kind of loathed and I tried to make them really loathsome. Um, but in the Athena Club books, I think everybody, every character is a character that I try to make sympathetic, even when they were not very nice characters. Um, the My favorite characters, of course, are the main characters. So Mary Jekyll, yeah. Diana Hyde, Beatrice Rappuccini, Justine Frankenstein, um, and uh, Catherine Moreau. In a way, it's not that Catherine's my favorite, but I have I had to inhabit her head so much because she's the one that's actually writing the books. So I'm writing the books through Catherine. I had to kind of be Catherine Moreau, who was originally made from a puma. So I had to imagine myself into the headspace of a woman who was originally a puma. I was going to ask you, if you put yourself into any of these characters. Mm. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, all of my compulsiveness goes into Mary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all of my wanting things to be certain kinds of ways, that's Mary. Um, Catherine is, um, Catherine is certain parts of me, especially the writer parts of me. Um, I think Beatrice and Justine, I can definitely see myself in. Diana's a wild child. She's the daughter of Mr. Hyde. And so um, she's in some ways, she's probably the least like me. And so I had to, it, it was a bit tough, but I thought of Diana as kind of just an id. Mary's sort of the super ego in some ways, the ego super ego, and Diana's the id. And so I had to let my id loose because in the end, I think characters always come from you. Um, you have to put little bits and pieces of yourself in them to make them come alive. That's sort of where the magic comes from. Mm -hmm. That is true. So what can we expect from you in the near future? Yeah, yikes. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, well, uh, I have another short story collection that I would like to publish. So I'm hoping that that will happen. Um, I am working on a novel. Uh, it's based on a short story that actually... I think it's in here. Hang on. Now I have to check. I'm pretty sure that it is actually in here. And if it's in here, I will show it to you. It's called Pip and the Fairies. Um, yep, it's right here. Pip and the Fairies, page 285. Um, yeah. So this short story. Um, and Pip and the Fairies is for anyone who hasn't read it, which is probably most people, because short stories are not read as much, but you should read it. Uh, Pip and the Fairies is about a woman whose mother was a children's book writer who wrote a book series called Pip and the Fairies. And she was Pip. She, she was the little girl that her mother based her main characters on. And in the Pip and the Fairies series that her mother wrote, her mother has also recently died, by the way. So she's dealing with her mother's death. But in this book series that her mother wrote when she was little, Pip meets fairies. And she can't remember whether her mother just made that part up or whether she made up stories of meeting fairies um, and she told them to her mother or her mother made up the stories and she kind of retroactively remembers because she has this vague memory that she actually met fairies and she remembers who they were. Um, and so she, after her mother's death, um, is going back to the place where her mother wrote these books, 
where she was actually not that happy. They were very poor until her mother kind of, uh, until the book series took off, her mother ended up making a lot more money. They moved away. Um, and she goes back and she's trying to figure out whether she actually met fairies. And that's what the short story is about. And when I finished the short story, I thought, you know, someday I'm going to turn this into a novel because I really want to write more about this. And so now I'm trying to write the novel version um, and we'll see where it goes. I'm, I'm a little ways into it. And, and yeah, so there, there's always this moment when you're not this moment, but there's this period when you're writing a book, when you're like, I think this is working. I'm not entirely sure where it's going, but it seems to be congealing and coming together. So I'm in that space right now. So are you an outliner or do you kind of take it as it comes? Really good question. Um, I, for short stories, I don't outline. Um, short stories are short enough that I have the entire thing in my head. And so I can write it. Uh, and of course it always ends up a little bit different than I thought it would, but in general, it's what I imagined and it comes out as a story. For things that are longer, um, I do kind of rudimentary outlining. What I often end up doing is I have a general idea of what I'm writing about. I write a couple of chapters and then I go, oh, this is fitting together. Now I know. Um, and then I write a more detailed outline, but it's never very detailed. For this book, the outline was three pages and that was it. So um, the, the most important thing was just figuring out, I don't know why I do this, but I always end up having these elaborate chronologies. Like I have to fit things in and make sure they happen in the right years. Um, and I remember moving things around um, and, and not hoping that I got everything on the right dates. And, uh, and so I tend to do that more than outlining. I do, when I have a novel, tend to have kind of a chapter outline. Like this is the chapter, this is basically what I'm gonna put in it. And that tends to be a couple sentences. So it's not an elaborate outline, but I have a general idea of what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have questions about you uh, as being a writer. What's your favorite part of being a writer? And it's on the whole writing and publishing process. My favorite part of being a writer is writing. <laughs> Good. <laughs> it Good. is absolutely the best part because I get to sit there and I get to make stuff up and that's, the best. Um, yeah. Uh, I, all of the writing stuff I like, I even like revising up until the moment when I have to send it to somebody and then it becomes a different thing because at that point I'm getting edits back, copy editing. I never love, um, the, the part where things are published is nice. Um, but it's the, the, the really fun part is the most fun part is writing stuff down, just creating the stories. And the second most fun part is meeting people who've read them and like them and meeting readers is pretty awesome. That's the second most fun part. Right. So what do you consider the most challenging part of the writing process? Finding time finding time and energy um, because writing is, it, it's it's not my full-time job. I have a full-time job. So for me, that's hard. I have friends who are writers for whom writing is a full-time job. And strangely enough, they have the exact same problem, have finding the, the right time, finding the energy. And also if you're, if writing is your full-time job, often, what you're doing is you're writing the stuff you really want to write, but then also writing other things, which you're writing for financial reasons, um, whether that's writing magazine articles or writing, you know, tie-in novels or something like that. Not that those can't be fun. They can be wonderful. Um, but for me specifically, because I, I do teach so much, just finding the time is the biggest challenge. 
the writing stuff, once I have the time, it's not the writing, the writing I really love. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what has been your favorite adventure during your writing career? Oh my gosh. Um, depends on how you define adventure. I mean, I had the enormous privilege at one point of um, going to Devon and spending some time with Terry Windling. That was amazing. Um, she uh, is one of the finest editors and scholars in fantasy, uh, as well as uh, a wonderful writer. And the uh, Terry Windling, Ellen Datlow books, the ones that they oh, edited, yeah. which I think people of my generation, whatever that is, Generation X, I'm Generation X, people of Generation X will remember how enormously influential those were. Um, they did the year's best fantasy and science fiction. Was it fantasy? Maybe it was year's best fantasy and horror. I'm trying to remember now. It was a long time ago, but they had these wonderful big year's best books. Um, and I still think they were, you know, the best year's best books. Those were enormously influential when I was growing up. Um, and also their um, retold fairy tale series was enormously influential when I was growing up. And so getting to meet her was a real privilege, but also wandering around the hills of Dartmoor was amazing. Going to Vienna and going to all the museums there, um, that was amazing. I don't know, going to Cornwall was amazing. I feel like I've gotten to do so many wonderful things. Going to different cities, um, going to a book fair in Budapest and uh, meeting readers who had read my books in Hungarian editions <laughs> and signing those books. That was, that was really cool. So I think there's so many different adventures. So you, your books have been um, translated into many different languages. Yeah, something like, it's not just the books, the short stories, and I don't know how many were the books versus the short stories, but it's something like 29 or something. I don't know. I could get the number wrong, but it's it's a fair number. I mean, I, I was, I'm surprised that it's as many as it is, but I think it's because science fiction and fantasy, which is where my books tend to be categorized, um, are, they're international, you know, people like that fiction all over the world, which I'm really grateful for. Yeah, that's great. So what, what is the greatest lesson that you've learned in your writing career? It's a really good question. Hmm. Don't compare yourself to anyone else. And, and it's not something that I've learned very well. Um, but you are not in competition with, no, I, I would say there's like a writing career lesson. That's the writing career lesson. You are not in competition with anyone else. Um, and you don't know what's going to happen to your writing. There was a, a particular day that this hit home for me. And it was when I was a graduate student and I was up um, in the university library on the floor where they keep all the English literature. And um, there was so much there from the 19th century, so many novels that people don't read anymore that had been bestsellers in their day. And many of the writers that we read now, um, writers whose works we treasure were not bestsellers in their day. Um, these were writers that may not have done very well when they were writing, and yet they became important to a later generation. Um, and I don't know whether it's better to be one or the other, whether it's to have you know, <laughs> bestseller status during your lifetime, that's pretty cool, or whether to go down in literary history. I, I don't know, but you don't know what's going to happen to your books and you don't know what your place is um, in the literary landscape. Uh, so the most important thing is writing what you love to write, um, whether or not, uh, however it does, and then hopefully um, having that reach some people 
So having some people go, oh yeah, this is, this book gave me comfort. This book showed me a bit of truth, something like that. Having someone connect with your book. Um, so that's, I think that's the most important thing I learned in terms of career. And then in terms of actually writing, um, I think the, for me, the most important thing, I guess this is a lesson I'm le I, I learned. I'm not really sure what it is, but it's to make it real. Um, and that takes, you learn how to do it over time. Uh, it's a, it's a learned skill. Um, I've talked to students about how to do it, but especially when you're writing about something fantastical, um, you have to use craft. Tolkien also talks about this because he's really smart. You have to use craft to make it real to your reader. Because if I say to you, um, my character went to Paris, you'd be like, okay, your character went to Paris. If I said, my character went to Brigadoon, you'd be like, what's that? <laughs> right? mm -hmm. Or my, my character went to Hyperborea. I have to actually um, describe that and make it real to you in a way that I don't have to make Paris real to you. So you have to, you have to make, you have to give the fantastic, the texture of reality. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so is that the piece of advice that you would give to, uh, to new writers or do you have any other advice? Oh my gosh. Um, I would give a lot of new advice. I, I'm sorry. I would give a lot of advice to new writers, but that's partly because I used to teach in an MFA program. Um, <laughs> yeah. and even in my own program, now I'm teaching undergraduates, but I still am teaching writing. Um, so, so you have a lot of advice. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of advice, but it also depends because every single writer is different. Every single student is different. Um, and so everybody needs something different. So, you know, I, I, the, the biggest piece of advice I would give to any writer is figure out who you are and, um, what you need to do in your writing and what you need to learn and realize that this is a field in which you're always creating your own path and you're learning. You have to learn all the time and you have so many teachers because every writer who has ever lived can teach you something, including what not to do. So mm -hmm. one of the nice things about writing is, you know, it's a little bit different from being a ballet dancer, a ballet dancer, your teachers are right there. You don't necessarily, you can watch videos of past ballet dancers, but you can't go back through the entire history of the art form. And as a writer, you can learn from ancient Greek tragedy. So you can learn something from absolutely everywhere from throughout the, the entire history of the form. All the writers are your teachers. Right. So are there any groups, clubs, or organizations that, um, that have might've helped you in your career that you would recommend to other writers? Yeah. And again, it totally depends on who you are. Um, mm -hmm. I, I profit from, and I like, um, learning skills for me, it was important. So, um, I, when I started writing, I really needed what the Odyssey writing workshop taught me. Uh, that was really valuable. And also I went to the Clarion writing workshop and that was enormously valuable. I had wonderful teachers, um, like James Patrick Kelly, Kelly Link, Pat Murphy, um, Steve Barnes, just, there, there were people who taught me so many things. Jean Cavallos, of course, at the Odyssey Writing Workshop. And then one of my favorite things that I've done as a writer is actually teach in the Alpha Workshop, um, the Alpha Writing Workshop for teenagers, which is kind of amazing because people have come out of that workshop and gone on to become um, wonderful professional writers. And my daughter followed in not my footsteps, but the footsteps of my students. And she actually went for two, um, two sessions at the two summer sessions at the alpha workshop. She's also a budding. Oh, that's great. <laughs> now I have some questions for you uh, about you as a person. What is one thing that most people don't realize about you? 
Oh my gosh. Um, I guess maybe people don't realize that I teach full time. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe, I mean, it's in all the bios, um, but maybe they don't realize that English is not my first language. Maybe that's something oh, wow. that people don't know because when I speak, yeah. it sounds like this is my native language. In a sense, it is. It is. It became my mother tongue, um, but it's my mother tongue by adoption. Um, my first language was Hungarian, and my family left Hungary when I was five years old. We moved to briefly to Italy and then to Brussels, and so actually, my second language was French. And my third language was English. I started learning English when I was seven years old. Um, and unfortunately, I forgot my Hungarian. Uh, the French, I kind of forgot, but then I actually took French in school. So I, I was able to relearn some French. And now I'm trying to relearn Hungarian, which is harder than it should be, unfortunately. But yeah, yeah. May, so maybe that's one thing that English isn't even my first language. Yeah, that I that is a good thing to... I, that is something that people probably don't know about you. Wow. Um, next question. It's, it's a, this is a tough one. Um, what question do you wish interviewers would ask you? And what would your answer be? Um, I don't know. I um, told you it was tough. <laughs> yeah. This is this is really hard because people ask such good questions. You're asking such good questions. Um, I feel like I've sort of been asked everything. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, I don't know. Are you going to ask about my writing process? Like how I actually sit down and physically write? Because that's oh, that, something that... <laughs> Do you want to ask about that? Yes. What? Tell me about your writing process. This, this is it. This is my pen. This is the best thing about writing is, well, I was going to say it's cheap. It's, it's partly cheap, right? Because I can <laughs> use this and I can use my um, notebooks and I have a bunch of different notebooks, but um, usually uh, I have just like a plain black notebook, um, just a moleskin notebook and uh, and I handwrite. And so everything is handwritten first. Um, mm -hmm. And I find yep. that things yep. come to me much better that way. And then I was going to say the non-cheap version, the, the non-cheap part of it is that um, I do have a laptop. The laptop was not cheap, unfortunately. But the actual sitting there and writing stuff down, that's pretty cheap. But yeah, but I, I handwrite everything first. And someone said to me, but not the novels, right? You didn't handwrite those. And I said this. Yeah, I absolutely had wrote this first. I have notebooks of manuscripts. So that even that was handwritten first. But I, you know, people have all different processes, but I recommend handwriting. There are other writers who handwrite things. Um, and I find that my thoughts flow and I handwrite in cursive. And it's just, it just comes and then I put it down and, Mm. How it happens. Ah, interesting. That's that's the way I like to write. Good. I'm glad I'm I have, not the only one. I know I'm not the only one. I have a huge collection of pens, a huge collection of notebooks. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, I have a but, bad I have I have very bad habits of buying notebooks and I don't have a, a pen habit. That tends to be a very expensive habit. And I know some writers have that habit, an expensive pen habit. I just buy cheap pens. <laughs> but I do tend to kind of buy a lot of notebooks and I buy books. That is my <laughs> other besetting vice, chocolate books. Okay, that was kind of coming to my next question. <laughs> what is or are your passions when you're not, when you're not writing? Reading. Um, of course, going to museums, looking at art, um, gardening. <laughs> I really love planting things. I don't get enough time to garden and I have a very small garden, but I try to stuff as many plants in it as possible. So gardening is one. I love traveling, um, obviously. 
<laughs> you can hear that uh, I yep. love going different places, seeing different things. Um, and uh, yeah, seeing performances, plays, dance, concerts, opera. How do you make time to do all these things? Mostly I don't. <laughs> That's the hard part. It's like, that would be your answer. There's the, yeah, there's the uh, the job and then there's the uh, writing. But the really nice thing is that because I'm a teacher, um, I have times when I'm not teaching off. So that's when a lot of this happens. Um, and my schedule has been erratic recently. Um, in 20, we're now in 2023. In 2022, I spent the spring in Budapest teaching. So I, I was working, but I was teaching on a Fulbright grant. Um, and then I was asked to teach during the summer in London. So I was in London for the summer and then I had the fall off. So I had a period of time when I could actually do some of these things, but, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a crazy schedule, but I really love teaching. And, uh, and so it's, it's just, it's a balancing act. So what does your writing space look like? And what do you have to have with you when you're writing? Uh, it depends. Usually I try to create a writing space. Uh, I'm not one of these people who can write in cafes. I do try to write sort of wherever I am if I have to. But right now, my writing space is a room. So I have an official office. This is not it, actually. This is my this is a, a room where I do a lot of teaching stuff. So this is. Uh, another kind of space. It's it's much smaller, but it's a small room. Uh, it has a desk. It has a good writing chair. Um, writers writers have back problems. That's one of the hard things about being a writer. Right, back problems and you know arm and wrist problems. Um, and it has my writing books. So, um, and by writing books, I mean things like books by Annie Dillard. Um, Anne Lamott, uh, Walter Mosley has a wonderful writing book. Stephen King has a wonderful writing book. Ray Bradbury, just all of these, uh, E.M. Forster's aspects of the novel, all of these books that are technical books. I've got dictionaries. I've got books of baby names so that I can look up where names come from for different characters, um, reference books, things like that. So it's, it's basically, I have an office and it's very quiet and it's sort of its own little space. And I find that it really helps wherever I live. I've tried to create a space like that. It's not always possible, but it helps me to have a designated writing space where I can just sit down and my brain goes, oh, okay, it's time to write now. Okay, and when you're writing, um, do you have any special food or drink that you like to have while you're writing? Water. <laughs> um, <laughs> lots and lots of water. Um, it's it's hard, right? Because it's very tempting while you're writing to snack because you're just sitting there, but your brain is actually consuming loads of energy. And so after a while, you start thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so tired, I need something. So um, in terms of food, I try not to snack while I'm writing because it's not terribly healthy, um, but chocolate is often very helpful. Uh, so I would say chocolate is my food of choice, my writing food of choice. Um, and either a big glass of water or I will make some tea but I try not to overdo it on the tea. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you're writing, um, do you prefer silence or do you listen to music? And if you listen to music, what kind of music? I mostly have silence, actually. Um, when I put music on, it's music without words. And it tends to be something that I can kind of ignore, to be honest. So, you know, I don't want to say this particular artist because... It's like, it's ignorable music, <laughs> um, but it but it does actually have to be something like that. Like, you know, if you have something by some 
composer that is very jarring or very catchy. I can't listen to it. Oh, you know what makes really good writing music is Eric Satie. Mm, really? It's, it's, yeah, it's very calm. It's very spare. Um, and it's very good writing music. So Eric Satie, I would recommend. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not the sort of person who needs noise or um, would write well. If I were listening to lyrics, I would be listening to the lyrics. I wouldn't be listening to the voice in my head. Hmm. And writers very often have uh, furry or feathered or otherwise non-human companions um, to either help or hinder them through their work. And do you have any of those? And uh, do they help or hinder you? I used to. I don't uh, anymore. Um, I live in an apartment and I can't have pets here. But I used uh, to have a cat um, that I had, even though I wasn't allowed to have pets in another apartment, not my current apartment, just in case my landlords. <laughs> to this um but yeah i i have had cats most of my life um when i was a child we always had pets we had cats and dogs um and then when i was older i was always working uh and traveling and i didn't really i wasn't in a situation where i could take care of a dog but i always had cats um and my last cat was um the cat of my heart her name was cordelia she was a Corby, I think they're called. Um, she was a tortoiseshell tabby. And um, Torbies have a certain personality. They are in charge and everything belongs to them. So she was the queen of every space she ever walked into. Um, mm -hmm. But she deserved to be because she was truly elegant <laughs> the, the most elegant cat I've known um and uh and she was very sweet and I actually um I I, I keep writing about her um I put her in one of the stories that is not in this collection it is wait is it no I'm not sure I think it's in this collection actually if you want to read about my cat Cordelia um I think I put the other Thea in here. Maybe it is in the other collection as well. Um, it is in here. Yeah. And, and I think it may be in the other collection. It's a story called The Other Thea. And it came from a project that was a book of retold fairy tales um, that I think came out from Saga Press. Um, and the editor, Nava Wolf, said to me, here are a list of fairy tales. Um, choose one and do your own interpretation. And the one I chose was a very strange tale. It's Hans Christian Andersen's The Shadow. And so mm -hmm. at the beginning of the story, the protagonist, Thea, um, is she's, um, she's graduated from high school. And the high school she went to was Miss Lavender's School of Witchcraft in Hartfield, Massachusetts. And so she's, she's now graduated and she's supposed to be starting college but she's taking a year off. She is feeling this deep sense of malaise. She's depressed. She's got ennui. She doesn't know what's wrong with her. And she texts um, some of the teachers back in her old school and they text her back and they say, well, you know, um, were you, have you been, have you ever found your shadow and come see us and talk to us and she she goes to her old school all of this by the way it's not really spoilers because this all happens in the first few pages of the the short story so she goes back to her old school meets with some of her teachers who are teachers at miss lavender school of witchcraft they're all trained witches and they say well you know do you remember when you came to school you came without your shadow and we had to write back to your grandmother who was your legal guardian and say what happened to tia's shadow and um your grandmother said, well, she was behaving so badly that I just cut it off and I put it in a box, but I don't know where it is. And so it's the story of Thea having to find her shadow, but um, her both helper and hinderer is one of the cats at the school named Cordelia. And of course she's a witch's cat and all witch's cats can speak. So I get to, uh -huh. I get to give Cordelia a voice. Oh which is yeah. A lot of fun. Oh, and that's she's great. very snarky. She's a very snarky cat. 
<laughs> oh, wow. So you mentioned uh, Massachusetts. So how how important has the New England setting been to your books or to your stories? That's a good question. Um, there have been a number of stories that I've set in New England, uh, and there are more that I want to set here. Um, I think there are three, I guess now maybe four settings that I go back to again and again. Um, one is Massachusetts or, or New England more broadly. I would say Massachusetts, Connecticut, Maine, that sort of general area. Um, and then there is um, Virginia, North Carolina, because I grew up in Virginia, uh, spent a little bit of time, not very much in North Carolina, but um, that for me is, it's what I know of the South. So something I want to set in the South, I generally set there. And uh, then there is Central Europe, which is where I was born and I've gone back often at this point. Um, so there are a number of, um, a, a number of stories set in Central Europe. And then the other I would say is London, stories set around London. Um, and that's also been kind of a locus for me, partly yeah. because I've spent so much time there at this point. Right. Okay. I have two more questions for you. Um, where can people find your work aside from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester? And I have to give a plug for Annie's. Um, you can get yay Annie's, <laughs> yay, yay, and yay Annie's, and yay Worcester. I love Worcester. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, I, there's a story I want to set in Worcester. It's it's oh, really? a murder mystery with witches and it's set a little bit outside Worcester. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. So yay independent bookstores. Um, I think honestly, you can find my books wherever you can find books. So um, you can find me online. I have a website. So you can just Google theodoragoss.com. And on my website, you can find information about all my books and stories and poems. There's a ton of information there, a whole bunch of links where you can find anything that's available online. I have a whole page titled free, and it's just where you can find anything I've written, where you can access it online without paying for anything. But then I also have purchase and there you have links to where you can um, buy books. But, you know, even if a bookstore doesn't have my books, remember you can always order things while also supporting your local bookstore. And of course, they're also available through all of the online, big online services. Mm -hmm. And if you um, if you want to order from Annie's, we hope you do, um, you can call us at 508-796-5613, or you can uh, email us at orders at anniesbooksworcester.com. So and please do. <laughs> <laughs> My last question to you is, uh, and you answered part of it. Um, how can we follow your work and share your awesomeness? <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, well, so you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Twitter. I'm not there as much now that Twitter is kind of going wonky a little bit. Um, probably the best place to find me is on Facebook because I tend to post the most on Facebook. So um, if I've written a poem and I've put it online, which I do quite a lot with my poetry. You can find it there. If I publish something, you can find it on Facebook, but also you can just go to my website. There's a ton of information on my website and on my website, you will find links to where you can find everything else. You can, I also have a blog and you can subscribe to my blog through my website. And it just sends you my blog posts um, to your, to your email address. Plus and again, you can find this through my website, but I have a poetry blog. So when I write poetry, anytime I write something new, unless it's already been committed to somewhere else then I promised it to somebody, but for the most part, anytime I write a new poem, I just post it on my poetry blog and anyone who subscribes can get my poem in their email inbox. Or I also post it on Facebook and you can follow me on Facebook and um, see the poem on Facebook. So there are... Lots of ways to keep in, keep track of me. Great. Well, that's all I have for you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for being here with me, Theodora Goss. And uh, thank you so much, Selena. Thank you for the wonderful questions. This was a lot of fun. You even let me get kind of 
theoretical. I feel like I was a little bit of a college professor. A little bit, which was great. So uh, we will hopefully be seeing you at our store sometime. Absolutely. I would love to come by. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Right. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.